Hello everybody and welcome to day two of Design Week 2022. I'll be your host today, my name is Clifford Swartz and today's topic is all about artificial intelligence and machine learning. I have an esteemed panel of guests with me today to discuss this topic with you, but before we dive deep into it, I'm gonna throw it over to Mia Lita in the booth and she's going to tell all of you wonderful people how to participate and a little bit about today's event. How are you doing, Mia Lita? Hey, Greg, Clifford, how are you? I am well. Well, welcome to day two of Design Week, where we are uh, joined by some of my favorite engineers talking about machine learning at the edge. And we're broadcasting live on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So please go ahead, like, subscribe, and share. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and post them in the chat so we can relay them to our panel of engineers in the studio. Um, and now, before further ado, let's talk about machine learning. Very cool. One really quick note of programming. Uh, if you guys go to microchip.com forward slash design week, which you can see on the screen right now, you'll see this wonderful landing page that we designed for you guys. It has general sort of information about the three day event that we're hosting. And if you were to click this register now button, it'll take you to the on 24 page where you can actually sign up and watch the various uh, classes, webinars, uh, demos and examples that uh, we prepared for you guys. We have a bunch about AI and machine learning. In particular, we have two about FPGAs, which we don't dive too deep into during today's conversation. So if you are interested, I highly encourage you to check it out. But it is free, it is quick, and a lot of people put a lot of effort into it. So check it out, I'm sure you'll enjoy. But I'm going to interview my esteemed panel of guests. To my left, we have Jan. How are you doing today, Jan? Hey, hi, Clifford. Good, nice to be here. Always good to have you. To his left, we have Sridhar. Howdy, Sridhar. Thank you, Clifford. Of course. Thank good. And through the power of the internet, we have two very special guests. Uh, first, we have Chris from SenseML. How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, good morning, Clifford. Good morning. And then from DigiKey, we have Robert. Howdy, Robert. Howdy, Clifford. Thanks. Glad to be here. Always. So, uh, I guess this brings us to the presentation portion, and I'm going to throw things over to Jan. Jan, why would somebody be interested in using machine learning at the edge? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, you know, I think you're going to show some diagrams to, to explain that, uh, the difference between the cloud and the edge. So if you go, to, you know, the bottom one, you know, people are used to cloud computing. Uh, so basically you get data, you, s you send it to the cloud, the cloud does its magic and send back, you know, responses right. or actions, something like that. Uh, so this is very good because you have unlimited access to memory, unlimited access to you know, resources, computing resources, things like that. So for a lot of application, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, if you have a lot of data to, to crunch. Uh, now, if you don't need all that, maybe moving to the edge makes more sense. Okay, and there, there's, there's different reasons here that we, we are highlighting. So if you do things locally now, you can do it faster because you don't have to, you know, communicate everything up to the cloud and back and things like that. So you do, th right. you do things locally. So doing things better means real-time operation. So for instance, if the application is home safety, you know, you want to have a quick decision. As fast as possible. You know, you don't want, if, if your Wi-Fi is spotty this day and your house burned down, you're like, no, you don't want that. Right. Uh, and the other thing is also better customer experience. You know, now that everything has to be fast, uh, so better uh, response time will also make you know, things flow easier. Uh, that's, that's, that's key today. But the other, the other aspects are also to reduce the cost. Uh, when you send data to the cloud, the cloud's you know, uh, manager will charge you the volume of data that you, you're sending. Of course. That makes, makes, makes sense. Now, if you don't do that, then you don't, you're not charged. So you reduce the cost by doing things locally. And also, because of the cost of the communication, you don't have to use a 5G or you know, whatever Wi-Fi uh, to send data. So it's another cause that you can, you can cut down, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it's more reliable. Uh, as I said before, you don't have to expect good communication to the cloud. So you can do it in maybe in the middle of nowhere, you know, the forest or the jungle. Right. Uh, we have application there. Or uh, maybe underground for mining type of application. So the only way to do it is to do it locally. And the last one I want to, to highlight here, the last two is privacy and security. You know, every, every time we're talking about cloud computing, the first question from people are, so people can hack it, and now that I'm sending my data to somewhere, who owns it? Can they sell it? Can they do anything with it? Uh, if you do things locally again, you get rid of these two you know, issues or you know, things like that. And the last one, very last one here is the power consumption. So 
everything is on battery now. We're trying to be green, or we try to have the longest battery life we can. You know, everyone wants to have two to ten years on the, on the coin cell. So if you don't need to have fast communication, which is burning a lot of power, then your, your, your power consumption goes down dramatically. So this is, this is key here as well, or why it's, it's moving to the edge. Um, another advantage for some cases is what we call the local learning. So now you, the, the application can learn your specific product locally to behave better or to predict better. Uh, so that's also a, a good thing about it. Very cool. I have to cough really quick. I'm really sorry. I promise I wasn't going to cough as much. <coughs> so uh, some of the challenges are some of the benefits that you mentioned about cloud computing at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? So now when you're dealing with the edge, you have a smaller footprint and yes. uh, you have limited computing resources. Exactly, and that's 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 the challenge or the, the you know thing. But you know, there's a lot of people working on this for for years. Uh, maybe you heard about the Tiny ML Foundation, and we right. have you know SenseML is part of the partners we are working with to really make the um, the software uh, the firmware smaller and use less CPU times and things like that. So there's there's tremendous efforts for the last you know five six seven years to to get there. And I think we're showing, you know, we're showing today an example of how you can w run on very, very small MCU now. Absolutely. And so my next question is, I like the technology. I think it's amazing. What sort of applications do we see this technology cropping up in now? <sighs> Everywhere, anywhere. Sure. <coughs> uh, so yeah, consumer here, as you're showing. Uh, of course, every, everybody's thinking about the, the fitness side of it, where you can track your, you know, you know what you're doing on the feet, uh, you know, walking or exercising and things like that. Can you improve your golf swing uh, by by using ML? That all works absolutely. Uh, appliance is a big one. Uh, we're showing smart toys here. Uh, is how do you interact with your toy? Maybe you can talk or you can touch, and they can, you know, feel how you want to interact with them and be a better experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we are we are showing a you know a kid here. We also saw it in maybe in the smart home uh, type of application is when you can listen to sound and take action on the sound. So maybe if you hear the baby crying, then you want to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the commercial side, it's smart building is a big, big one. Uh, everybody wants to save costs on heating, cost on power, make things safer. So that's a, that's a, a good market as well for us. Agriculture. I uh, was listening on the radio this morning coming here that we have to save water. Uh, so there's a lot of effort again on how we can maybe sense the moisture of the ground better to just have the level of water needed and no more. And of course industrial. So uh, industry 4.0, uh, predictive maintenance is a big one. So how can I make my equipment perform better for a longer time and save on maintenance cost? And predictive maintenance is really the big, I think the biggest mover today uh, for machine learning at the edge. And you see here also some of the wearables. Uh, how can you maybe improve HMI to make products safer to use or faster, uh, for instance? Nice. So genuinely sort of every application can serve to benefit from yeah, this. Absolutely. I dig it. So Sridhar, what sort of tools do we need to accomplish this? That's a good question, Clifford. Uh, Jan mentioned what you call a myriad of examples spanning across different industrial lines. So now there are different frameworks or software development environments that are available to enable customers to start the development process. So let us touch upon today the TensorFlow Lite, which is one of the uh, Google's machine learning framework to deploy machine learning models on various devices, be it the mobile, uh, desktops, and other edge devices. So it's nothing but a free and open source machine learning library. So what you do in TensorFlow is you basically take and implement and train a machine learning algorithm. Okay, so you, depending on the uh, application you're using it in, the model comes out smaller, bigger, whatever it is. So now, as we highlighted the beginning of the presentation, this is machine learning at the edge. So. What we need to do next is take these models and convert it into something more compact and contained to run it on an edge device. So what TensorFlow Lite does in this situation is provides you the necessary devices, I mean necessary tools 
to run your models on an edge device, be it the microcontroller or a standard microprocessor. Um, as you, and you may ask me why is a TensorFlow Lite important, right? So as we highlight on the slide, uh, it is basically built to fit into an embedded system application. So the, it has a small binary footprint when you come and develop the model. And the good thing is it is not any operating system dependent, so you don't have to run behind an ARTA, so it can run bare metal. And uh, also, first and foremost, the important thing is you don't really, it's not dependent on any C or C++ libraries associated with it. So it is pretty, A, it is compact, the dependencies are less, so it enables you to get it up and running faster. So there are quite a few use cases uh, for TensorFlow Lite. I think if you go to Google Colab, there are some ready applications like gesture recognition in, in TensorFlow, basically using accelerometers and gyros. We can control applications that perform different tasks. Then there is image recognition using TensorFlow, and we also have speech recognition. So some of these uh, examples we do cover in uh, our different training models, what we come out with. So. This is, in a nutshell, what is TensorFlow and how it helps you to get up and running. Cool, thank you very much. Do you mind expounding a little bit about how TensorFlow Lite would actually interface and interact with a microcontroller? Okay, uh, if you look at this, this slide, bear, this is another way to look at the flow what I described before. Uh, what we are showing here is, as I mentioned before, it's TensorFlow Lite is nothing but a set of tools that enables on-device machine learning, by helping developers run their models on mobile embedded and any IoT device. So having said that, uh, in your development flow, the first and foremost step is creating and training a neural network model using TensorFlow, as that is the bullet number one, what we have highlighted there. As I mentioned before, these come out as fairly large models, so then we use the TensorFlow Lite converter to get it into a TensorFlow Lite format. So, at the end of this second step, what we get is a runtime library from the TensorFlow Lite. So we combine that with uh, our integrated software development framework, which is the MPLAB Harmony V3, or the third version of Harmony, which not only supports microcontrollers 32-bit, but also microprocessors, other uh, wireless and security devices and, and whatnot. So it has a range of uh, <clears throat> application areas available. So here what we have done essentially is most of our customer base is familiar with MPLAB and its ecosystem consisting of the IDE, the compilers, assemblers, linkers, debuggers, and whatnot. So we have now added a TensorFlow light component into the Harmony framework. So <clears throat> here is another screenshot of an, a typical application. So what you see on the left side is when you pop open the uh, this MPLAB code configurator, as we call it, which helps you to configure and enable the device to start your development process. We, you can pull in and bring in the TFLM, which is nothing but the TensorFlow Lite model, which is a component that is available on GitHub. So you pull it in, now you have your runtime library. So you can pick any of the devices, as I mentioned before. Uh, the TensorFlow Lite is optimized for the Cortex-M class of uh, controllers and processors. So now, since it's uh, ARM compatible, we have also provided the customers the necessary enabling functions uh, to use the SIMSYS DSP and neural network function, so you don't have to go anywhere to do it. So it is available as one of the pull-in components, and so that basically sets you up for your uh, development activity. Very cool. So you got your TFLM, you got your runtime model, you got your machine learning library, you have your necessary uh, functions, whether be it the uh, say a SIMSYS DSP or uh, SIMSYS neural network model. So what you also need to observe on the left side is uh, you see a UART or a serial connection between the uh, the CIR CIRCOM, which is nothing but a serial communication on the device, to your, uh, your I.O. Basically this shows all the, what uh, TensorFlow does is it throws out a lot of uh, debug information. So as you are developing your process, you also need to know what is right, what is wrong. So uh, this function enables you to um, not only see it, but 
know what is going on as you go through your development process. So once you have this uh, setup ready, we have also highlighted the, the tools and packages that are required, be it the MCC, which is the code configurator, the version of the IDE, and then all the different uh, components within the Harmony framework. The good thing about Harmony framework is it is not only enabled for TFLM, there are a whole slew of other libraries which the customers could benefit of, be it the USB, TCP IP or graphics and uh, so depending on the type of application you want to develop, you can pull in the necessary libraries and start your development process. Uh, it's specific to uh, TensorFlow Lite, we also have provided a front-end model. For example, there is a Google Colab expert example known as MicroSpeech. So we, had, we do provide the analog front-end so you don't have to go and looking for a front-end. So you can take the front-end, interface it to the uh, example application that is already available and voila, you are up and running. And I think the last bullet point is also talks about the repository where you can pull in the TensorFlow Lite model. So in a nutshell, uh, once you are in the, your familiar MPLAB ecosystem, you don't have to get out of it whether you are using uh, yeah. any class of microcontrollers or microprocessors, you are up and running. And just to pause you right there, I think we have a question from the booth. So Mia Lita, take it away. Hi Clifford, yes, um, I have a question for Sridhar. Sridhar, did you say that TensorFlow Lite is, is free to download? Yes, you are exactly right, that's a good question. Uh, TensorFlow Lite is a, what I call an open source and free library that was developed by Google specifically for machine learning purposes and they also have provided a slew of examples to get it up and running. So you don't have to pay anything so long as you use it and deploy it on known supported devices uh, like be it the microchips, microcontrollers or, or microprocessors. Yes, you are right. Great, thank you. And then another question about that. Do we have um, examples in TensorFlow only for SAM32 or also for, for PIC32? Uh, we do have examples predominantly for the purposes of this session. We are focusing on ARM Cortex-based uh, devices. So we would be talking about those things. I mean, uh, that's what the TensorFlow Lite is uh, optimized for. So this session, we are specifically focusing on the, uh, the Cortex side of the world. Cool. Any other questions? I dig it. So a uh, really quick note of programming. There was a link at the bottom, and we will make sure to have that link in the description and in the comments. And if you guys cannot find it, just email us at livestream at microchip.com, and we will make sure that you get what you need. Moving back, uh, it's a perfect segue. What sort of examples do we have within Harmony, uh, MPLAB Harmony 3 for people to play around with? So if you go, um, yeah, th this kind of slide kind of uh, talks about the whole thing, right? I mean, the hello world, which is, has been the ubiquitous Classic. example that has been there forever. So in this particular example, it's not, nothing but it shows you like a sine wave value. So what we are shown here is how you can use the elements of machine learning in, com in conjunction with the, what do you call the tools and other things that are available from TensorFlow Lite to get it up and running. Uh, we have other examples like MicroSpeech, uh, which is kind of an audio oriented application. Uh, like a digit recognition, which basically not only shows you what digit you are writing, it also helps you with gestures and then the, the mag magic wand, which is basically using an accelerometer. We kind of define it uh, into four different classes of gestures. Be at the thing. I would not read what is written on the slides, but you can go through it. Then the good thing about this is we are running it on different platforms. Uh, as you see, I have highlighted at the top of this slide, you see MCU32, which is nothing but the 32-bit microcontrollers, starting with the Cortex M7, which is the SAM E70. And we also have example applications running on the Cortex M4, which is the SAM E51. Uh, there are two different uh, class of boards that are available. One is known as integrated graphics and touch, which is, this, uh, which is again based on the Cortex M4. And then we also have for, uh, which basically aids in your, if your application is graphics and touch oriented. Uh, and we also have another class of boards known as the Curiosity Ultra, which is the CULT, which is kind of a catch-all uh, kind of a development platform. So those are the microcontrollers that are supported. 
and you see what are supported with different examples. And we also ha do have support for the SAM A5 or the Cortex A5 microprocessor. So we have a similar development platform for that class of devices. So we ha do have example applications running on the Cortex A5. And last but not the least, uh, towards the end of this quarter, we'll also be running the magic wand example, the, the number four one also on our uh, wireless platform. When I say wireless, I think that kind of also segues into what uh, Mia Lida was asking before as a question. So that uh, platform has a MIG32 MIPS-based device and, and a wireless device uh, combined into one. So we have a development platform for that. So we'll be running the example on that class of uh, device too. So, so that's why the MPLAB, when you are in the MPLAB Harmony software development framework, you get all the benefits of running it in different class of machines, depending on your power performance or peripheral requirements. Cool. So we've talked about the software, we've talked about the hardware. Do we have any sort of evaluation kits for people that sort of ties it all together? Yeah. You read my mind, you're <laughs> a slide, kind of a slide ahead mm -hmm. of me. So yes, we have different evaluation kits in addition to what I mentioned before. These are more uh, compact and uh, lines up well with uh, the microchips, uh, long time story of total system solutions. Now, if you look at the, the red PCB that is there, it, has, it not only has a SAM D21, which is a Cortex M0 plus class of device, but also on board with uh, privacy and security being important these days, we also have our ECC 608 secure element. It also has a, a Wi-Fi module, all on a single piece of PCB. So we are not saying that you would need everything in an application, but depending on what you want to do, we do not want you to limit and keep shifting boards to just to enable you to uh, start your development process. So. What you're seeing here is uh, we do work with different third parties. Uh, the two boards, what I have shown here, one comes with the TDK uh, accelerometer sensor board and the other one is the Bosch BMI 160, which is a six axis sensor, also has an accelerometer and, and a gyro. So using these, we have uh, developed certain examples. If you go on to the... Uh, oh, I'm gonna pause you yeah. really quick. I think we have another question from the booth. Yes, please. Yes, we have a question from Michael on YouTube, and he's asking, um, will this work with our SAM E51 uh, Curiosity NATO development kit? There are some, I mean, there is nothing that stops it from doing it. I think the only uh, thing you need to be careful is uh, C, I mean, the E51 C Nano, or the Curiosity Nano, is a compact development self-contained board, and you could, port it and run with it, but if you need to expand your application to add, let's say, a, a gyro, like a BMI 160 or a TDK device, you may want to uh, what you also get the uh, Curiosity Nano expanded base, which provides you not only the required click interface, uh, click interface parts, but it also provides you uh, additional expansion capabilities. Yes, uh, can TFLM run on a Curiosity Nano SAM E51, yes, but uh, one thing you need to be careful is what do you need to run it, in which case you also would need the uh, Curiosity Nano expanded base and which will make it a complete kit. Very cool. So very good question. Thank you for asking and very good answer. Thank you for answering. Uh, I interrupted you though, I apologize for that. <coughs> You're about to talk about demos with these evaluation kits. Yes, please. So if you Go to the, so we have, uh, as uh, mentioned before, uh, we, work, we do work with uh, different third party partners. I think we have two of them uh, today on our uh, catalog house, DigiKey, and also we work closely with SenseML. So using these boards, uh, we have created different examples. I mean, for example, with SenseML, we have created a gesture recognition using the, the, the development platforms, what I highlighted before. We also have a fan condition monitoring, basically, you, check the, what do you call, uh, there is a known good condition for the fan and if there is some aberrations, whether it be it, what do you call, noise or the, the blades are rattling and you can uh, develop those uh, and simulate those fault conditions and uh, what do you call, adjust it depending on what the fault situation is and if, for if, example, if you are in a HVAC kind of a situation, you could monitor the voltage, 
over current, under, under voltage, or any other parameters, and then take the necessary action to shut, shut the machine off rather than ending up with a burnt up motor. So right. that, that's where some of the example applications kind of point you in that direction. And these are tools essentially to get you up and running, obviously depending on your specific application example, you may have to fine tune it further and we are here to help as the case may be. So some of these examples of what are highlighted in this slide are running on the boards what I highlighted before. We also have uh, other examples, uh, for example, there may be certain speech processing kind of examples which do need a little bit more processing power and memory footprints, in which case we do have the Cortex-M4 class of machine. So here is an example of uh, a keyword spotting and sound recognition we have developed using the Cortex-M4. Uh, the board shown here is a Curiosity Ultra SAMe51 board, so as you see, it has expansion capabilities and then you can add on, uh, maybe it could be a Kodak board or any other thing what you need. It could also be a, a, a sensor if you need to as, do some sensing activity. Uh, so the options are limitless. So, and we do provide you not only the hardware boards, we are supported well with our third party ecosystem for these click boards, uh, microelectronica click boards. And we do work with a lot of our third-party software vendors, be it Edge Impulse, SenseML, and uh, uh, TDK, Bosch, and you name it, to provide you the complete kit or complete uh, wherewithal you need to start your development process. Absolutely. And so the partner's comment is a really good segue. That brings us to the end of our demos, but I'm going to throw it over. Oh. I think we have a question from the booth. Mia Lita, take it away. Hi, yes. We have a question from PLC Worker on YouTube, and he said, would this example work over Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi? Can I repeat the question? Yeah. Would it work over uh, Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes. You need, yes. To, you know. And you'd, uh, what, what you would need in that case situation is we do have what you call uh, the, the transceiver or the Ethernet transceiver or Mac or backnet kind of devices, uh, be it uh, 10 base T or 10 100 base T devices. Yes, you can have an Ethernet ba backhaul. Uh, that, that there is nothing that stops you from doing it. As if you look at this board, we can uh, we do have what do you call it? We do have the Sam E51 Curiosity Ultra board. What I talked about, uh, we do have a LAN uh, 8740 a transceiver, which is nothing but a, uh, a wired kind of a backnet to support your application requirement. Great, thank you. Cool. Any other questions or no? I dig it. So I'm going to throw it over to Robert from Digikey, and he's going to talk to you all about his example, which uses SenseML. Robert. Thank you, Clifford. In today's demo, we'll utilize Microchip SAM IoT with a Micro IM14 clickboard. It is utilizing TDK's 6-axis MEMS IMU with SenseML Analyticals Toolkit. Microchip provides an excellent IMU data logger application that is built through MPLAB. Microchip will show the GitHub page for this application at the end of the webinar. For my demo, I made two small changes. The first was to tweak the data format into SenseML's data capture lab will actually understand. The second was to increase the same rate. Uh, Mia Lita is showing off this awesome SAM IoT kit from Microchip. Very cool. Thank you, Mia Lita. So first, pumps are designed to move liquid. So we're going to be talking about brewery and problems in a brewery. Air or anything that is compressible is very bad for the impeller in the head assembly on these pumps. Over time, this will cause premature wear or physically destroy the pump. When an operator is near one of these liquid pumps, it is very easy to detect changes with your own ears because you'll hear grinding or chalk noises. Our goal is to detect this without an operator present. So the, the brewery, there's usually two types of pumps. You have a, a simple one phase, just plug in the AC from, from Birchman or three phase pumps from Thompson's. Uh, three phase pumps usually have speed controls, whether RX-485 or just push buttons. Uh, both pumps usually have a simple on or off. So there's not a lot of control for, for most of these. In our demo today, we're using a Riptide pump. Here's the internals of it. It is magnetically driven, and the 
the liquid going through it is the lubrication, so we had to place the IMU very close to the impeller and try to keep it away from the other side. Uh, here is a uh, slide of some of the quick data. On the left, we have standard laminar flow, uh, full speed of the pump, the liquid. On the right, the water level of the tank started to drop, so we started introducing air bubbles into the flow as it's emptying. So for more on SenseML, here is Chris. And Chris, take it away. It is your show. Great. All right. Uh, thanks, Robert. So we're going to take a brief pause uh, from Robert's demo just to give you some conceptual understanding of what's going on so you'll appreciate sort of what the steps that were that were involved. So if we look at uh, the flow of time series data through the uh, analytics and the uh, inference process that takes place at the edge, you're starting with some form of a time series physical sensor. Uh, that could be sound data, it could be motion from the IMU we saw. Uh, in Robert's case, he's using vibration data, I believe. Uh, but this could be you know, pressure, current, load cells, you name it, right? There are just you know, a, a variety of different sensors and even combinations of sensors that can be employed to provide sort of the, the, uh, the raw data coming into the model. But what we're really interested in is not those signal waveforms. We're interested in understanding something that's of insight to a particular application, right? If I'm building a, a baby monitor, I don't want to see necessarily the raw waveforms coming from the microphone. I want to know if my baby's awake and crying, right? So uh, the purpose of the ML model is to uh, go through uh, the pipeline of processing the data and that, the process involves a number of steps. The first step is just basic filtering and uh, pre-processing of the data. That could be things like averaging, it could be adding filtering, uh, it could be uh, downsampling or normalizing the data. So that's kind of your first step in this process. Second, second step is uh, that you need to uh, identify the regions of interest. After all, I've got a time series that's, you know, uh, continuing, and I, I need to mark sort of a beginning and an end of a, a region of interest that I want to classify. So that could be as simple as just a sliding window that's going by, uh, where I find a, a fixed window of time, or it could be based on some triggers, like an energy or a threshold detection uh, that I'm using as a criteria for setting what's the event that I want to analyze. The next step in that process is then to do uh, what are called feature transforms, where you're taking that raw sensor data and you're providing uh, some transformation of that data so that what gets fed into the classifier is something that maximizes the opportunity to separate those classes and accurately provide the insight that you're looking for. And then, you know, that brings the final step, which is the actual ML classifier itself. And with uh, Sensimol, we support a range of classifiers that goes from uh, neural nets, in fact, using TensorFlow Lite, as uh, Sridhar was uh, talking about earlier, down to very simple types of classic ML models like uh, you know, support vector machines, decision trees, uh, distance-based classifiers like k-nearest neighbor or radial basis functions. So uh, all of this is embodied into the toolkit that helps you take raw sensor data and turn that into events of meaning. So the process that you go through, uh, for anyone who's familiar with supervised machine learning, this will be a very familiar process, but it's one that's more intuitive to somebody who's a domain expert. So rather than having to be a machine learning expert and understanding you know, the, the ins and outs of what's going on within the classifier, your job within the Sensible tool is to focus on the uh, application and sensor regions of interest for your particular application type. So you do that using the data capture lab uh, to first collect uh, using data acquisition samples of the actual data as you would see, uh, and then labeling that data for the regions of interest and applying the labels. Like if this was the sound data, I might pick a region and say, this is, this is a region of data representing the baby crying. Right? And I'll collect numbers of different examples to cover all the different sources of variance and uh, 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 build out a robust data set. From there, uh, the magic is within what we call Analytic Studio, which uses a process called AutoML, which takes uh, machine learning uh, to actually apply the process of building a machine learning model. So 
typically you might have, you know, in a traditional sense, AI framework tools where you have a data scientist who has, you know, experience and understands what types of classifiers they want to use, what types of feature transforms they need in order to get the kind of results that they're looking for. In this case, uh, we have a tool that allows somebody who knows uh, essentially nothing about machine learning to press a, what we call the green button and use AutoML to allow the tool to decide for itself what the best combination of pre-processing and models uh, should be. Um, you can go from you know, that sort of very simple approach to a more directed approach. If you have some expertise and you know what you're looking for, uh, the user interface allows you to move to a directed search where you can specify uh, details of the model that you're looking for, um, all the way up to uh, a, a, a version of the, 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 the workflow that allows you to use a, a Python client interface and use familiar tools for you know, machine learning experts like uh, IPython Notebook or Google Colab. So the point of this is, is that you won't outgrow the capabilities of the Sensible Toolkit. You can start from pushing the green button to directed search to using the Python client extension to do it in a programmatic fashion. And then what you get at the end is a model that you can then test and validate on the device with what we call test app or in what Robert's using is our more recent application we call Open Gateway that is an open source version of a test tool. So then we sort of pull all this together and within uh, the, the microchip family of devices, we have uh, a, a toolkit that uh, supports not only the Cortex SIM class 32-bit uh, processors, but also all the way down to the 16 and 8-bit uh, AVR class. Uh, when I mentioned that we support a lot of different classifier types, TensorFlow Lite being one example, and then uh, decision trees or uh, distance-based classifiers, the point is, is that those, each of those types of uh, machine learning classifiers has different memory requirements uh, in terms of the complexity. So uh, what the tool allows you to do very effectively is to build the very best model using the memory uh, limitations that you have on board for a particular device. So uh, whether you're using an 8-bit uh, AVR device or you're using the SAMD, you're gonna get the best model that you can uh, based on the resources you have available. And the flow that we're showing here is that uh, we have integrated the toolkit to be able to pull data in from the MP Lab Data Visualizer tool. Uh, that then gets imported into our data capture lab where the labeling can take place. And then the analytics studio where the auto ML process can generate the code that you can flash. And then, you know, this is a virtuous cycle where as you you test the device, you may encounter uh, examples where uh, you didn't uh, initially expect at the beginning. So you might want to collect more data and refine the model over time as you build the data set up. Testing, testing, so testing, hopefully testing, that gives you a good understanding of the testing, process. Testing, and testing, with that, I'll turn it back to Robert and uh, he'll proceed to show you how he's used it with his uh, pump demo. Very cool, Robert, it is back to you. Thank you, Chris. To start our training for the sensor, I've imported 30 seconds of data into SensorML's data capture lab here. It's shown here on the left, on from laminar flow and to capitation on the right. The top signals in this case are all the accelerometer data and the bottom are gyro data. For uh, SensorML, I'm only going to use the accelerometer data, so the bottom data we can just pretty much ignore. All the lines you see on the picture, the blue and red, the blue are start of a signal and the reds are the end markers. So I'm going through this waveform, figuring out what I like and what I don't like. And I mark it as whether it's flow or cavitation. And one of the things I discovered while using this tool, it was very important to not to go too big with the sample sizes. So it, it seemed to work better with the smaller samples. So next, inside SensorMill's uh, build model tool. So this is on their website. Uh, here we use their standard window segmenter and I tuned the window size down to about 100 samples. Um, in our case with the pump, it's running about 60 Hertz. So the vibrations are kind of slow. So it seemed to work best for my data and testing. And I should mention, yeah, I went back and forth a couple different times with this, trying different data until something seemed to work. So after we've built it online, uh, 
we can actually download it for our specific board. And SenseML gives you a lot of options here from different compilers, different boards, different sensors, uh, whether you can build it as a library, um, you can also get the source option. And whether if your board has Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or serial, you can actually choose how it interacts with the gateway app. So in our case, I just chose a serial download. It's, a, it's just a standard blob, so it fits right in our semi OT board. So finally, using SenseML's open gateway application, we can qu quickly create an end user application. So on the left here, we can see if, as the data, as the pump was actually flowing liquid, and when anything random would happen, it would say no flow. And so with this quick app and a couple days of work, we have a quick indicator of, of flow and no flow. And yeah, I should also mention, yeah, it took a couple revisions to get this working, so, but once it was, it worked pretty good. So thank you, Chris, and SenseML for this awesome tool and microchip for your board. I dig it. Thank you very much. And so that brings us to the end of the presentation portion. Really quick, I'd like to go over some further resources for people at home if you are interested in uh, reading a little bit. First, we're going to show SenseML's plans, and I'm going to hand it back over to Chris to walk you guys through it. Great. Yeah, so uh, getting started with the Sensible tool, uh, we have a range of plans to meet the various needs of users, as you can see. Um, but uh, to start with, we would suggest that users start with our community edition. It's a completely free evaluation, and it's not trialware. It doesn't time out, so you can use it as long as you need uh, to get to a point where you understand that the tool will suit what you're looking for. Uh, you can build uh, models with that, uh, and it comes with uh, a single user license. And then as you expand out into some of the paid versions, then we can add multiple users. You might have many test technicians ga gathering data. You might have multiple domain experts that are labeling data for a common project. So the tool scales up uh, to support you know true team uh, project development uh, and has versioning and session management so that uh, you, know, you can build real products with it. Uh, the other difference with some of the premium tools is getting the C source code uh, fully available so that uh, you can modify the models thereafter and, uh, and uh, integrate that fully within your code. Cool. And I think we have a question from the booth. Mia Lita, take it away. Hi. Yes, thank you. So I first have a comment. Um, Chris, I saw on the slides that... Um, you know, you would think that machine learning is so fancy, you always have to use a 32-bit you know, or a 16-bit, but I saw an 8-bit listed there, so I was quite excited to see that you can, you know, do machine learning, uh, but with something that, you know, that's, that's just very easy to use uh, as fr from the microcontroller point of view. Um, secondly, I have a question here. How small can the models be um, when, when we use SenseML? Yeah, absolutely. So we are, we are very excited to be able to have... Uh, you know, support and inclusion for all those 8-bit MCUs out there. There's plenty of them doing great things, and they've been largely excluded from the world of AI, uh, given that most of the frameworks support 32-bit. Uh, so uh, the smallest models we can build, uh, all-inclusive, can be as small as uh, we've, we built one uh, that was 9K. Uh, so perfectly viable to fit within, say, the AVR class uh, using uh, simpler mo models, such as maybe a distance-based classifier. But you know, the, the important thing to note is that if you do a good job with the feature extraction uh, and do good class separation, sometimes the actual classification job can be fairly trivial uh, if you've done good feature pre-processing. So that's what the tool really seeks to do, is to really optimize for a compact model. Everything doesn't necessarily always need to be a neural net. It's great in some cases, but in other cases, uh, you know, the, the best model is the one that fits on your device and gives you accurate results. So that's what we strive to do. Cool. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Not for now. I dig it. So uh, one thing that I'd like to point out is on the SenseML, there's lots of cool different features, but one of the things is the auto ML, the green button that Chris referred to earlier, and every single one of these plans gets you access to that. Um, the pretty powerful tool that it is. But moving towards uh, Robert's portion, DigiKey has a microchip page, which you can read all the different uh, things that DigiKey has in relation to us. So I recommend you go and check that out. If you want more information about the tools that he used specifically in his demo, uh, here is the actual kit 
that uh, he used. And then furthermore, we have the GitHub repository that uh, he modified and uh, was able to use. We're going to have links to all of these in the description and in the comments. And uh, if you can't find them, once again, just email us at livestream at microchip.com. I should start saying say it with me before I do that now. But uh, at this point, uh, Mia Lita, do we have any other questions from the audience? We don't have any more questions from the audience, but if, if you do, as uh, Clifford said, please send it to livestream at microchip.com. Um, I do have one uh, for Sridhar. Um, is there anywhere that people can go to learn more about machine learning, but at their own pace, because we covered a lot today? Yes, uh, we do have what is known as the microchip or developer help or microchip developer help site. Uh, there are the examples what we discussed earlier as part of this presentation are definitely part of that tutorial. It is a learn at your own pace. It also has uh, right from getting started and all the different application examples and different steps, the type of boards we have used, the other, what do you call, uh, accessories you would need, the software tools, the files and the procedure, which basically give, walks you step by step into uh, what do you call developing or walking through an already developed application, and then hopefully using any of the tools like uh, SenseML, what we mentioned earlier on, to modify it to depending on your application needs. So yes, uh, please do visit this Microchip Developer Help. So there are applications what we talked about, and there may be more. Uh, and so it is kind of a, a repository for all the training uh, needs. Cool. And if there is no more questions, I would like to stress once again that the event does not end when this live stream does. You can go to microchip.com forward slash design week, and it will take you to this wonderful page. Click register. It is quick and free, and we already have things live now that you guys can go check out. So I highly recommend you do so. But at this point, I'd like to give a huge thank you to my esteemed panel of guests. Thank you guys very much. It's always a pleasure. And uh, tomorrow's live stream is going to be all about security and FUSA, functional safety. So be sure to tune in for that if you are interested. But uh, stay happy, stay healthy, and I will talk to you guys soon.